Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to start in a few minutes uh, with exploring by the sound, exploring the sounds of Gray's Reef with exploring by the seat of your pants. We have our panelists here. Uh, so as you start filing in, um, find something comfortable and uh, make sure your uh, uh, speakers or headphones are on because it's gonna it's gonna get loud. So looking forward to it. All right, it's high noon. Uh, like I said, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Pruitt. I am the Outreach and Social Media Coordinator for the Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary located in Savannah, Georgia. Um, I wanted to uh, welcome you to today's talk uh, with uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and the NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Talk's title is Exploring the Sounds of Grays Reef, uh, which is a national marine sanctuary located off the uh, coast of Georgia. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to our host for today, Joe Grabowski. All right, Ben, thanks so much for the introduction and welcome everybody to today's uh, live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. As mentioned, my name is Joe Grabowski and I run an organization called Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. So I'm gonna take just a brief moment here um, to share my window. There we go. And talk a little bit about Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. So, uh, we bring science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms uh, across North America. Uh, each week, we've been running three to four live events a day with different scientists, explorers, virtual field trips. Uh, the website is exploringbytheseat.com. It's really easy uh, to join in. So as you head to the website, you can see that there's a spot for the newsletter, a few of our upcoming events. We've got live events coming up with the Jane Goodall Institute of Canada, the Sea Turtle Hospital in the Florida Keys, live feedings of seahorses uh, and sand tiger sharks at the Toronto Aquarium. So lots of events uh, to choose from if you would like to join us. All right, I'm gonna come back from that screen share and talk a little bit about what we're gonna get up to today. So as mentioned, um, there's a lot of interaction available for today. We're gonna have some Q&A action. You can find that in the panel on the right. If you check the chat, I've also shared an option for a Slido room. So if you use that link at the bottom, it'll bring you to the room. And in there, we have some interactive polls that are gonna take part, or you can take part in during the event. So feel free to head over there with that link, fill out those polls for us, because we'd love to see what you're thinking about at home. All right, well, as many of you may or may not know, the ocean is a loud place. Animals of all different sizes make noise to communicate with their own species and others. And we are so lucky to have an amazing team at Gray's Reef who's going to spend a little time with us today helping us understand a little bit more of the sounds in the ocean. So I'm going to turn things over now to Chris Howard. He is the Sanctuary Program Specialist at Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary. Chris, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Just going to share my screen here. All right, so like Joe said, my name is Christopher Howard and I'm the Sanctuary Program Specialist here. And I'm gonna be talking to you about Grays Reef and exploring. I'll be talking to you about uh, Grays Reef. But first, I'm gonna talk about the National Marine Sanctuary System as a whole. There are 14 National Marine Sanctuaries, which are highlighted here in this map by the blue circles, plus two, uh, two monuments, the Papa Hanau Mokuakea and the Rose Atoll, which are the triangles here on the map. There are over 620,000 square miles of ocean that's protected. And just for a reference, that's larger than the state of Alaska. NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries, which, are, which were established and actively managed by the agency under the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, were, direct, were there to sustain appropriate ocean use. So, a little, the first lot of question. Before today, how many of you have heard of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries before? Mm -hmm. 
it's you know, a way to get a different show to see what these responses are looking like. All right, so just a reminder to everybody that the link for the Slido room is in the chat bar uh, on the right of your screen, so you can get in there. But so far, Chris, 100% of respondents say they have heard of the National Marine Sanctuaries before. Wow, that's great. So, Gray's Reef was the fourth National Marine Sanctuary in the United States, designated back in 1981 by President Jimmy Carter. And Grace Reef is a 22 square mile area located about 19 miles off the coast of Georgia, which is the coast right here. Although Grace Reef is a sanctuary, it is also a multi-use area. Grace Reef is open to the public for recreational fishing, diving, and boating, as long as regulations such as no anchoring and spearfishing are followed. The research area was established in 2011 in the southern one-third of the sanctuary. And that's designated here by this dotted line. And the research area is for science purposes only and gives researchers a place to study the open ocean that isn't is impacted by humans. Grace Reef has an average depth of about 65 feet and it's made up of live hard bottom. This is a little different from coral reef, which most of you might be familiar with. Uh, there is a hard cement like sandstone down here and that, that hard uh, cement-like base allows sponges and corals to grow on it, and that's what builds up this live hard bottom reef. This hard bottom habitat is a hot spot for biodiversity, with about 200 different spe fish species and over 900 different invertebrate species. Now let's see if you can name any of the fish or inverts in this picture here. You just find me to look and see what all you can identify. So you might have all noticed all the fish in the background, like the angelfish here, the large group of scad right back here in the back, and the sheep's head and the dark could be you here. But you might have missed some other living species, which are the invertebrates, like the uh, the barrel sponge, some of the oculina, tunicates, and then some algae. And these are all make up the reef and allow fish to have habitat and, and food to eat. In that Gray's Reef, NOAA conducts a variety of scientific projects that support the understanding of our marine ecosystem to be able to protect these species for future generations. Some of the projects include monitoring the health of the fish and turtle populations through conducting surveys, habitat surveys to understand where fish species like to hang out, Invertebrate surveys where we look at sponges and corals to determine the best conditions for growth and survival. Plan ID to catalog, oops, plan ID to catalog what plants are the reef and determine their health, and monitoring invasive species such as lionfish, which are threatening to the traditional food chains within the reef system. Researchers like Allison and myself use scientific diving as a tool for research. 2019, 23 scientific divers dove at Grace Reef, and combined, they spent a total of 276 hours underwater, over 579 dives. Last year, the majority of the dives at Grace Reef were made possible by ship time provided by NOAA's ship, Nancy Foster. This shows the importance of annual Nancy Foster missions here at Grace Reef. Now, Allison, can you, uh, can you tell us about what life is like on the two week long research expedition? I'm going this over you, Allison. Hi, everyone. My name is Allison Sauce, and I am a researcher at Grays Reef National Marine Sanctuary. And good, you're seeing my screen. <laughs> I am here today to talk to you about um, some of the ideas that we're doing at Great, uh, some of the research that we're doing at Great Reef. Uh, I also um, want to talk to you what life is like aboard a uh, NOAA ship, Nancy Foster, and also to um, 
Also, uh, give you a brief introduction on a project that we're heavily involved in to learn more about the underwater sounds at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. We're also doing research to be able to track animal movement at Gray's Reef off the coast of Georgia. So I'm sure a lot of you are wondering what life is like aboard a NOAA ship. Our journey starts in Savannah, Georgia, where the Gray's Reef headquarters are. We would take, this summer, we took a car up to Charleston, where the home port of the Nancy Foster is, and we made our way down to Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which is 17 miles offshore of Sapelo Island, Georgia. While on this way, we had a great time being able to get a tour of the ship and uh, learn about all the different safety procedures that go on. It was always fun to see our staff putting on these goofy looking immersion suits uh, to make sure that we knew what to do in case we had to abandon the ship. To be able to conduct this research at Gray's Reef, Gray's Reef normally use, utilizes two smaller vessels for our ongo ongoing research projects. Reaching Gray's Reef from our home base in Savannah requires a two hour commute by boat which we're, and we're unable to stay there overnight, which can really limit our time underwater. However, every summer we enlist the support of the NOAA ship. For a two week period to conduct more intensive research. The Nancy Foster is 187 feet long and it's a fo floating laboratory. 187 feet is equivalent to the length of five school buses. The ship has a crew of 22 who support scientists in safely conducting this research. The ship is well equipped to support both diving and scientific research. There's available, uh, we also ha have at our hands um, the most highly qualified marine biologists in the world. Over the two week period, researchers this summer were, were able to conduct 421 dives. Individually, I personally logged 18 hours underwater throughout this exhibition. One of the advantages of having the Nancy Foster available for research was the ship's fine scale habitat mapping capabilities. When we weren't busy diving, we were busy day and night mapping the differences in the depths of the ocean floor to determine which areas were sandy and which areas were ledges. We used a technology called multi-beam. With this technology, the ship emits a sound waves that bounce off the bottom of the ocean floor and returns to a receiver on the bottom of the boat. The Nancy Foster ship would go back and forth across the sanctuary to be able to capture this data and translate it into a map like you see over here. The warmer colors, the warmer colors like red and yellow indicate the shallower areas and the cooler colors like the blues and the greens show the deeper areas. Our typical day starts bright and early and after a delicious breakfast, we would all gather our research tools to prepare for our daily projects. By 7.30, we were in our wetsuits and ready for our very important dive and safety briefing. By 8 a.m., we were ready to deploy the small boats. The ship uses a crane to, to deploy smaller research vessels to help us serve in the dive operations. Here's a video of what it like uh, looks like um, while we're deploying these boats. It really is an amazing collaboration and we have to be aware of our surroundings. We have to walk safely over to the side of the ship lower ourselves down over a rope ladder onto the small boats amid the waves. Then we are heading to our first dive sites. On our way, we often encounter sea turtles taking a breath at the surface or even a pod of spotted dolphins playing together. We were just as excited as they were to get splashing in the water. To be able to find our dive sites, we used a global positioning unit, which a lot of you might refer to as a GPS. Once we were at the site, we deployed a drop marker. This drop marker has a float at the top and a 
mushroom anchor at the bottom. This mushroom anchor is different from any other anchor and we use it to make sure um, that we're not harming the reef and that we're able to be able to find our, our dive site because there's definitely some low visibility once we get in the water. Once we're at our site and the drop marker is deployed, we start getting our dive gear on. We also spend time checking our dive buddies gear and go over our dive plan. When we're ready, the boat captain will say, dive, 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 and we will roll off the side of the boat. To indicate to the boat captain that we're okay, we'll do a big okay sign. Once in the water, we have to keep a close eye on our dive buddy and the drop marker because there's often strong currents and we're not able to see the ocean floor since it's 70 feet deep. This is a video at eight times the speed than it normally happens. But as you can see, there is sometimes limited visibility. And this is due to the nutrient rich water sourced from the multiple rivers along Georgia's coast. As we're swimming down, you can see the plankton floating past you. And I often get the Star Wars theme song stuck in my head. You have to make sure you keep a close eye on the line. And once you're on the bottom, if you can't find the ledge, sometimes we'll use our compasses to guide us in the right direction. Here is a video of some of the research in action. You can see this white square that is divided into smaller squares. This tool is called a quadrat, and it helps our researchers count the different species of invertebrates. These three divers sampled 30 sites and looked at over 359 quadrats. Here's a picture of me doing some research while doing habitat surveys. In this picture, I'm measure, measuring the height of the sponge. And in this picture, I'm measuring the height of the ledge and also the undercut. Some of these undercuts can be really, really deep. And this is where a lot of turtles and fish like to hang out. Once we're done with our research, while underwater, we inflate these safety sausages like a balloon that's attached to a reel. This indicates to the boat captain that we are on our way up. Once we're up, we'll use a ladder to get back on board and we'll log our dives. We'll then pick up the drop marker and head to our next dive sites. In the morning, we did two dives. In the afternoon, we did three more dives. And by 11 a.m., we are headed back to the ship for lunch. Once on board, we took our tanks to get them filled. We took off our wetsuit. We stored all of our data sheets and samples, and we headed to the galley for lunch. After eating, we would load up our tanks onto the small boats and go over our dive plans and safety briefings. After our afternoon dives, we would head back to the ship and once again offload all of our gear. After showering, I would head to the galley for a well-deserved dinner. I often enjoy these dinners because we were able to spend some time with the crew. This crew was just waking up from uh, getting and getting ready for their uh, nighttime shifts. After eating, we'd head to the top, top deck, which we called the Steel Beach. While up there, we had our dive briefing, where, debriefing, where we talked about our day and what our plans were for the next day. After all of that, we'd sit back and enjoy the beautiful scenes of the open ocean. We really had some incredible sunsets and clear starry nights. The stars were so vibrant due to the lack of the light pollution. When the sun went down, our day was not quite over yet for us. We loaded up our dive gears with full tanks 
and spent our evenings inputting data and processing our samples. If it was not too late, we'd make our way down to the movie theater. And to be honest, I don't think I ever made it through the opening credits before falling asleep. We had some long days, but it was worth every minute. It was really an amazing opportunity to be able to explore so many different sites at Gray's Reef. I learned so much from this group of dedicated researchers. Now I've got a question for you. What would you be the most excited about living on a research vessel? A, being out of cell phone range. B, the clear starry nights. C, all you can eat food or D, diving at Gray's Reef. All right, I do want to jump in here for a moment and help those out who are having trouble finding the Slido room. If you can't find the chat option, um, if you go to Google and search Slido, so S-L-I-D-O, uh, that'll bring you to the Slido main page, and then you can just use the event code REEF, R-E-E-F, and that'll bring you into uh, the poll questions. So you can take part in those. So Slido, uh, and then the event code for today is REEF, and let's take a look at what we're seeing so far. All right, so we've got a two-way tie between the all-you-can-eat food and the diving at Gray's Reef. We've got a nice split uh, with most of the answers following under there, and I can, I can definitely see the food part. <laughs> oh, yeah. On day one, I found out where they were stashing all the candy. I don't think I lost any weight on this trip, <laughs> even though we were doing so much diving. Okay, well, now I'd like to talk to you about some of the other research that we do at Gray's Reef. One of the projects that we're conducting without the support of the Nancy Foster is understanding ocean noises. Sound and hearing is essential to many different types of marine animals, and it's the, one of the main tools they use to survive. It's our mission at Gray's Reef to maintain a good habitat for marine animals that live and pass through the sanctuary. Able to reduce the threats to these animals while also promoting responsible use. NOAA is interested in assessing the sounds produced by marine animals, wind, waves, and human activities to be able to make comparisons over time between the different sanctuaries. There are seven national marine sanctuaries and one national marine monument participating in this research. All of these sites are very have very different habitats and marine animals living in it. In addition, each of them are impacted by humans in different ways. Both living and non-living things make noise. The sound within the ecosystems are referred to as soundscapes. Both natural and human generated noises can be heard underwater. There are biotic noise source sources that refer to those produced by living animals. Some instances where animals make noise are to be able to communicate with others, to be able to avoid getting eaten, and to find a mate or locate their offspring. Also, species such as whales use noise to be able to navigate and locate to find habitat. Some examples, uh, abiotic noises refer to noises produced by non-living physical processes such as rain, rain and wind. Now I just want you to think to yourself, what are some sources of human manufactured sounds in the ocean? Over the past century, human activities such as energy exploration, recreational boating, and shipping have increased along the coasts, offshore, and in deep ocean environments. Noises from these activities travel long distances underwater, leading to increasing increases and changes in the ocean noise level. At Gray's Reef, we want to be able to understand how human-produced noises may be impacting the communication and movement of animals within the sanctuary. These are pictures of spectrograms. 
Spectrograms are tools that researchers use to be able to visualize sound being produced underwater. Right over here, you can see where the frequencies are uh, as different animals and noise sources are at different frequencies. And over here, you can see the time. You wouldn't think that you can hear these sounds too well underwater, but you can, with this technology, we're able to record them. You can see that sonar makes noises and folks definitely make noise. rain makes noise underwater. You can visually see these disturbances by these spectrograms and you can understand how they might be interfer interfering with animal communication. Before I go any further, I want to tell you a little bit about sound. Oh, when you've stood next to a loudspeaker, you may have felt vibrating energy. off of it when you're playing loud music. This vibrating energy is referred to as sound waves. Sound travels in a wave pattern that we cannot see but is measured by technology. Sound can move through solids, liquids, and gases to get to another location. This is how you're able to hear sounds outside and also underwater. Underwater sound travels four times faster than through air. Different animals communicate at different frequency ranges. Frequency refers to how close the waves are together. Down here, you can see lower frequencies where the waves are farther apart. And up here, you can see higher frequency where the waves are close together. Different animals have been evolving throughout the millions of years in the ocean, and each one have been able to carve out a certain notch in the frequency to be able to best communicate. We're trying to understand these different frequencies to be able to monitor species populations and their movements and reliance on noise. Now, how are we using this knowledge of frequency in our research? At Grace Reef, we deploy underwater microphones called hydrophones that record the sounds at all frequencies underwater. These recordings provide sound experts with, um, with data so that they can be able to identify different activities within the sanctuaries and compare it to the historical data to other research sites. These hydrophones have to be switched out every four months and we send it off to the researchers to be able to decipher what we've heard. So what does it sound like at Gray's Reef underwater? This spectrogram may not look very distinctive, but when the experts get hold of it, they can break it into individual pieces that can identify aquatic species and naturally occurrences and human activity. Think of it as a symphony of many different instruments playing to create one soundscape. We have the oyster toadfish here on the base. We have, on the mar maracas, we have the snapping shrimp. There's a dramatic percussion coming from a school of startled cobu. And 
our lazy black sea bass drummer making some beats. I understand that some of these noises may have been difficult for you to hear. So that's why we made sure to put in our handouts a recording of all of these sounds for you. We compare our symphony with those produced along the different, the, within the national marine sanctuaries across the East Coast. Two that we are comparing with are Selwagon Bank and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. This data establishes a solid baseline that will be critical for providing future insight in the health of our Atlantic fisheries and ecosystems. It is also revealing some interesting comparative data. Researchers have found that Gray's Reef is more naturally noisy than other sanctuaries due the, to the type of fish species and abundance of snapping shrimp. On the other hand, Stellwagen Bank and the Florida Keys have a higher level of boat and ship traffic. One final activity that I'd like to briefly describe is a process called acoustic telemetry. Acoustic telemetry involves tag the tagging of marine animals with acoustic tags and deploying devices that record their movement. Very simply said, we are tracking animal movement to find out where fish go to the grocery stores, where they sleep, and where they find partners. An acoustic transmitter is a unique code for, it's a unique code. Each of these tags that are in the fish transmit this code every few seconds and it is able to be detected by our underwater receivers. When a tagged fish comes in proximity to the receiver, the unique code, date, and time are recorded on the receiver. Scientists dive to switch out these recordings, these receivers, and download the data to be able to discover which tag fish have been in the area. In addition to our stationary receivers, we can detect fish movement using an autonomous underwater vehicle. This is a fancy word to an underwater drone. This device can also support detecting fish sounds as it acts as a moving microphone. We can strap whatever type of instruments on it that we would like. The robot swims up and down the water column and every time it surfaces, it communicates with a satellite and a researcher is able to direct it to its next research location. For these technologies to work, we first need to be able to tag the fish with acoustic transmitter. This past season, we are specifically interested in tagging black sea bass, which is an important economic species along the Georgia coast. The tagging process is quite unique. First, we need to catch the fish and handle them carefully aboard to make sure that water is moving through their gills. We make a small incision in their body cavity and insert an acoustic tag. We use sutures to close up the incision and then we dive the fish back down to the reef to ensure a safe descent. Researchers from sites along the East Coast are collaborating with their tagging activities to better monitor fish habitat or fish movement. Our receivers act as a logbook for species that come in and out of the sanctuary or that even remain within the sanctuary. Over the past 10 years, we have found that 160 animals that were tagged by researchers outside of Gray's Reef have passed through. This includes 18 different types of species and 11 of which are different types of sharks. We also have found that endangered species the Atlantic sturgeon and threatened loggerheads have also appeared at Gray's Reef. To conclude, I would like to talk to you a little bit about marine science. Marine science is very collaborative and it does not just involve marine scientists. It also involves many other fields such as engineering and social sciences. Our staff also do not just talk to scientists, but we collaborate with fishers, divers, 
the general community, and policymakers. It is a constantly evolving field with new technologies. And all of our research is critical to better understand our oceans, and it is essential for us to be able to help us manage and conserve our marine resources. Now, how can you get involved? Let's say, be curious, ask questions. Don't ever give up on your passions. Volunteer when you can and don't let seasickness hold you back. Thank you, and uh, please be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Do you all have any questions? All right, awesome. Coming back on camera here. Uh, Allison and Chris, thank you so much for that great presentation, not only introducing us to the sanctuary, but also some of the amazing research going on and the incredible sound that you can hear. It's really neat to hear all those sounds uh, separately and I think maybe you should think about in the future maybe mixing them like a DJ and see if you can come up with like a <laughs> like a beat track to go with the sounds of Gray's Reef that'd be pretty cool <laughs> all right well to those who are joining us today uh, the question bar is on the right so if you want to start sending us in some questions there I can see a lot more have found the Slido room so there's another option in the Slido room to send in some questions so feel free to send some there but before we take our first question I would like to update because we've had a lot more uh, who found the Slido room. So I can update some of those polls uh, and those results that we heard from before. So backing up to the who has heard of the Marine Sanctuaries before, 84% uh, said that they have and 12% uh, came back with a no. And then for most people, the most exciting thing about being on an ocean research vessel for them would be the diving. So 72% said they'd love to do the diving. 12% said the food after it all came out. 16% were up for those clear starry nights. But out of everybody joining, nobody wants to leave their cell phone behind. I think they all want that <laughs> cell phone signal uh, so they can stay connected to the main world there. <laughs> we all did right. have internet on board, but no cell phone service. <laughs> all right, all right, interesting results there. Okay, so we have five-year-old Acacia joining us. And this question is directed right towards Allison. Allison, why did you get interested in science? I think science is a really interesting field. I um, am not just interested in the biological side of science. I'm also very much interested in the social science and uh, economics as well, and understanding how all of them uh, interact with each other. Um, I'm really interested in how life works and how life evolves and how us as humans are are interacting with that. So um, I'm not just interested in hard sciences, but I like to see how science can be applied um, to us humans. All right, Chris, I'm gonna turn that question over to you. What got you interested in sciences? I would say kind of similar. I've always, marine science specifically, I always just enjoyed being out on the water and fishing. And that's kind of what led my curiosity to see how just what make fish kind of do what they what they do, you know, how, like, why do they choose where they go, where they go, why they just act the way they do? That curiosity just kind of led me to the marine science field. This is always going to learn something new. Very cool. So we've got Noah tuning in. Noah is curious about Gray's Reef. Is it a hard bottom habitat? Yes, it is a hard bottom habitat. Uh, this, the breakdown is roughly 25% of the sanctuary. It's that hard bottom, so it's made up of, you know, the coral and sponges like we mentioned before, with the rest being kind of, the other remaining 75% being kind of sandy areas. But within that that small kind of 25% area that is hard bottom, that's where you get all those, you know, 200 different fish species and 900 invertebrates there. So it's, it's things that are really compacted in that 25% of the sanctuary. All right. Great question. Really incredible down there. You, you feel like you're in Dr. Seuss land because <laughs> all the sponges and corals are coming out from everywhere. And it's something that I've I've never seen anywhere else. I've gone diving. Yeah, and that's that's what I try to always explain to people when they ask why I love to dive so much. And you know, you can go for a walk in the forest and you might catch a glimpse of a deer or or a rabbit as they're darting away, but you're just surrounded by light when you're diving on a reef. And it just it's just a whole nother world and experience. Sure and it's always nice to see too how unafraid the fish are to come up to you when you're diving. Oh. If you sit still, they'll come you know, right up to you sometimes. 
Yeah, I got bit by a black sea bass while trying to change one of the receivers. <laughs> They're very curious. <laughs> All right, the hazards of, of diving on the reef and trying to get those sounds. Uh, Molly, Molly would like to know um, about the sounds themselves. So you, you collect these sounds, how do you then match it up to the fish? So we have sound ex experts that look at those spectrograms, which were those uh, brightly colored images that I showed you. And each, each different type of fish and animal um, emits sound at different types of frequency ranges. So first the researchers look at each of the different types of ranges. They know that usually the fish make sound on those lower, the lower frequencies and dolphins make sound at higher frequencies. So that's how they're able to sort it out that way. But also each fish has a different sound characteristic and it's a certain pattern that you can visually see in the spectrogram. So right now we can identify, oh, that's a fish sound. But now the experts are, are comparing with different other sanctuaries to look at those exact signatures and patterns to be able to identify, okay, what type of fish is this? All right, great question. We've got Elizabeth joining us, and you talked about the reef and how it's a very biodiverse place, but she's wondering what's what's really common. If you jump in the water, what are you going to see for sure? What are a couple of fish species that, yeah? Well, uh, definitely the spade fish. It's a really common fish out there in black sea bass. You see those all over the place. Is there uh, any other ones you can think of, Ali, that are super abundant? We see. I see a lot of really big flounder and red, a lot more red snapper now, which is exciting. And we also get um, a lot of barracuda too, which is fu always fun to see. They they are very curious in what we're doing, but um, always always keep their distance. And uh, sheep's head and triggerfish and a lot of the smaller fish like tom tate and um, and and scad too as well. All right, so uh, in the Slido room, I'm gonna grab a couple questions now. So Isabella uh, is wondering, she says that you guys have her dream job. So she's wondering about some advice, uh, you know, to start down this career path. I guess I'd say, as I said, don't, don't give up on your passion. Um, always, if you might, if you don't do well on a test, just use that as motivation to, to do better on your next one. Don't, don't let that hold you back. You can, you can do it if you're passionate about it. And um, if you're interested in a specific job, um, I would try and volunteer in that type of position. And then you can gauge what type of tools you might need. And if you, if you need to take a certain class at school, you'll, you'll know, know better um, what's required for that type of position. How about you, Chris? So yeah, that's really the best advice. Not and you know, believing in yourself and not knowing. Don't let anyone tell you, you know, you can't do it just because, you know, you may feel like as if you're, you know, maybe not as well as good in school as so, you know you think you could be or things like that. You just always have to know that you can get it done and you can do it if it's something that you're really passionate about, like Ali said. You can always follow your dreams. All right. Great advice. I mean, it's what you're gonna be doing for the rest of your life. So you might as well chase your passion so that you enjoy every day of it. So it doesn't feel like work some days. Okay, so Jennifer, and now I know you posted some of the clips uh, that you played from today's call, uh, but Jennifer's curious about, is there anywhere online where we could find maybe some other species that have been recorded uh, at Gray's Reef? We are in the process of up updating our website, so I'm sure that soon we'll have those up and we'll also post, post them on Facebook too. I just got a, a great recording of some um, North Atlantic right whales that passed through Gray's Reef as well. So um, we're very eager to, to share all of that with, with you. But uh, right now we are still in the data processing um, stage of this. Like we, we know it's a fish, but as I said, knowing what type of fish uh, is still the question. So we'll be updating our Facebook and website with all of that to be able to share with you um, what, what we're learning. Perfect, something to look forward to and a reason to follow on social media to get the updates for when there's new stuff to check out. Uh, who do we have here? Michelle, Michelle's curious about, and I mean, this is the question right up my alley, what about the sharks? 
in Gray's Reef. <laughs> Yeah, we, we definitely have sharks um, from our from our research with uh, the tagged fish. We found that there are 11 different species of shark that come through Gray's Reef. We've had great white sharks come through. Um, those were initially tagged in Massachusetts. So it's pretty cool seeing them come through and, and they don't come through just once. They'll co come every year. And we've got uh, great whites. We've got lemon sharks. We've got bull sharks. We've got tiger sharks. We have sand tiger sharks too. And uh, a lot of nurse sharks too that like to hang out underneath the ledges. Yeah, and then some uh, hammerheads that came up from the Bahamas and I uh, made a nice long trip to make their way up the Gray's Reef. Yeah. All right, very cool. Yeah, it's fun. They, they don't uh, interact with us so much. We, we don't see them. We see the nurse sharks quite a bit underwater, but uh, we're always, excited when we see a bull shark or uh or um a sand tiger shark too all right sounds like a very sharky place very cool very lucky um chris chris wants to know uh you know we talked about the sounds that animals are making what about the impact that human sounds can have on animals is there um maybe a little bit of research uh in that department going on yeah, and, and that's one of the main things that we are trying to figure out how um, we're trying to record the different sounds that humans are making. So um, the sources of that are oil exploration, uh, using when boats use sonar to be able to find fish that that does make noise underwater. Um, and we're also just boat traffic as well. So we're, we're trying to figure out more now how it does impact communication. Um, and there have been studies too showing how um, how this interf how there's been interference with uh, whales communicating as well. Um, humans were using a, pretty much the whole spectrum of frequencies, um, which is making it challenging, very challenging for all sorts of different species. So that's, that's what we're trying to figure out. All right, I like this question. This question came in from uh, Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas wants to know, is there any disturbing sounding fish, like something that you heard and you're just like, whoa, uh, that's scary. Um, I don't know, I think it's all cool to me. Um, <laughs> I really like the oyster toadfish. Um, sounds, the grunting sounds, and you can tell it, it changes throughout the year too. In the summertime, they they definitely get louder. Um, there's one fish that that sounded like a squish, squishing sound, um, and we were trying to figure out what that was, and we think it might be a midshipman fish, which is interesting because we might not be able to visually see all of these fish at Gray's Reef, but what the sounds help us do is be able to to see what fish are there. Because we can hear them. So we're um, we're trying to identify all of those right now. And uh, there's definitely some some weird making noises. I like the ones with the, the cubby you um, being startled. That was, that was pretty neat. <laughs> all right. We have five-year-old Eli joining us. And he wants to know how big those transmitters are that you, that you put in the fish so you can kind of know when they pass by. Yeah, these, these transmitters aren't aren't too big, and it, it, the size of the transmitter really depends on um, the size of the fish that we're tagging, and also um, how long we want the tags to last. The, the tags that we're using on the black sea bass are about that big, so just a little smaller than than your thumb, and um, and these tags will last us three years or will last three years, so. Yeah. But there's other ones that are that long that um, they might implant in uh, larger fish like the sturgeon, and those can last up to 10 years. So uh, you can get some really interesting data from that. All right, very cool. Uh, let's see, Sandra. Sandra wants to know, um, is there volunteer opportunity? So is there volunteer opportunities within the sanctuary? Uh, maybe to learn to dive and get out and, uh, and help out with some of the research. 
Oh uh, yeah. Um, ben, who was on earlier, is actually our he's the research coordinator at Gray's Reef. And most things for which you can probably reach out to get some uh volunteer opportunities. Just you know, reach out to your sanctuary. And that's the one of the good things about a sanctuary, you know. It's your sanctuary as well. You're free to, you know, use it. And you have every right to go, you know, volunteer and enjoy, enjoy it. And we are looking in the future to, to develop a more of a volunteer dive program as well, because um, we could definitely use use the dive support. So be be in tune for that. Um, that, that will come, come soon. All right, very cool. Let's squeeze in one or two more questions before we have to wrap up for today. So let's see here. Okay. I think it's a good one. So Colleen is curious about the production of the sounds. Can you tell us how maybe a species or two produces some of those sounds that we heard? Maybe one of the fish species and maybe one of the shrimp species? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm not a sound expert, but I do know that um, a lot of different animals have different uh, fish anatomy and um, they're the shape the structures of their mouths can be able to um, produce different types of types of noises um, and the snapping shrimp the, they've got that big claw that that produces a lot of the noises too so um, and and um, a lot of the grunting too has to has to do with um, with the fish's anatomy and, and what they're capable of, of doing so yeah all right so let's take one more question here we're going to take this one from amelia and we're going to the nancy foster with this question she is wondering about some of the other kinds of equipment that you might find on board uh the nancy foster for research okay so we've got the the four small boats to be able to do the daily dive operations they have that multi-beam and they also have a device called a ctd and that stands for chlorophyll, temperature, and depth. And this device uh, has a bunch of bottles strapped onto it. And they use a crane to deploy it off the side of the ship. And as it goes down, each of the bottles open up a little compartment so that they can take water samples at different depths. And scientists are able to analyze that and see as they go down the water column, what the chlorophyll, which is an indicator of, um, of plants, uh, what the chlorophyll levels are and what the temperature is like and what the depth is like. Um, and they're able to have samples from uh, all along the, the water column. So um, that's another um, neat tool that we were able to use on the Nancy Foster as well this year. And we have two labs. Uh, one of the labs was um, a wet lab, so that's where we had all of our, our dive dive supplies there. Um, and then we had a dry lab where we had a bunch of computers set up um, to be able to monitor both the, the multi-beam data that we were collecting and um, the, the data from the CTD as well. And I'm sure that they have many more tools that they can use too, but those are the ones that I was introduced to this summer. And you can check out their website too on Facebook. Very cool. Um, I'm going to make a quick change here. There we go. Uh, and Ben, do you want to pop back in for a moment? I think it'd be great to see everybody who made this call possible today because it was a ton of fun. All right, Ben. Yep. While y'all right. were uh, while y'all were answering questions, I was trying to do my best to keep the uh, the go to webinar questions going. So. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, uh, check in the actual question box. I've been trying to keep those up to date. All right, awesome. Well, I want to start off by saying a huge thank you. I want to thank uh, Ben, Chris, and Allison for spending some time with us today, uh, introducing us to Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, taking us on a little trip to hear some of the sounds, see some of the sights of you know life on board a research ship. Uh, that was pretty darn awesome. And obviously, a huge thank you to everybody who tuned in with us today. Uh, your questions were great, really well thought out, um, and it's fun to see what's on everybody's mind uh, when they're thinking about the sanctuaries. Absolutely, Joe. Thank you for your time. We appreciate the uh, your your end of the organization and being such a good host for us. And 
I encourage anyone if they when they have the opportunity to go out and visit their sanctuaries and uh, go fishing, go diving. They're your they're your parks, uh, ready to be explored. All right. Well, again, a huge shout out to everybody who joined us today. Uh, thanks for spending a little bit of time with us, and uh, we're gonna sign off for today. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.